Okay, so should hey. we? Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Topos Institute Colloquium. Today, we are pleased and honored to have Juan Pablo Vigno from the Department of Mathematics at Caltech. And Juan Pablo, he's a pioneer in the field of information cohomology. And today, he'll be speaking to us about cohomological aspects of information. So Juan Pablo, whenever you're ready. Hi, and thank you for the introduction. And th thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, yeah, I hope this this uh, chronological stuff interests other people, so that it actually becomes like a like a field, you know. But uh, yeah, I, I just want to introduce in this uh, in this talk uh, some like general foundations of this information cohomology uh, thing. Uh, I I will be more vague than what I like, but it's just it's very technical to some extent, and I don't want to spend too much time on those technicalities. So I'll try to give like a very general overview of what it is about. You'll have to believe me that many things actually work, but I know most things by heart. So if you really have answered as our questions towards the end. Uh, after the talk, we can certainly go into the details, okay? But yeah, I I will try to avoid that as much as I can because then in a second part, I would like to talk about more recent results like that are not always directly connected with the information community, but I would like to be connected with that. So like maybe a bunch of open problems that are, that that I, I will propose a bunch of other problems that maybe some people here will know how to solve. Um, okay, so let's go. So in fact, the first slide is not about information cohomology, but I said, okay, I have to say something about information in general because otherwise this is very unmotivated. And in fact, if you go back uh, to Shannon's uh, seminal article, no, like uh, on the math, like the mathematical theory of communication, uh, this like functional form that we call today uh, Shannon's uh, discrete entropy of 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 uh, discrete random variable with law uh, given by these numbers uh, is somehow justified in the article in two different and unrelated ways. One is algebraic, okay? So and you can already find like an algebraic characterization as the entropy in that article. So it's up to a factor. The only continuous function that satisfies certain recursive property that in the context of information theory is called the chain rule. Okay. So what is this chain rule? Uh, is that, okay, the entropy is for Shannon a measure of uncertainty of a random choice. Okay, so he, he gives this little example. Okay, you have a, a random choice with like three possible uh, outputs, okay, and certain probabilities P1, P2, P3. Now, you could first sort of coarse grain this choice. So instead of choosing between three, you could put these two outputs together, choose between this group of two outputs or the third one. This first, this is a first random choice. And then you have like a conditional choice with these conditional probabilities that will be uh, picking the first one or the second one in, ca in case you went on this first uh, path. And the measure of uncertainty of the original choice should be re like recovered from the uncertainties of this iterated choice and in this way. So it's the uncertainty of, of the first choice and then the uncertainty of the second choice, but weighted only by the probability of that second choice in indeed happening. Okay. And of course, this is like a little example, but like he says, well, this should hold in general. So you can, in general here, you'll have like an expectation value on all the possible uh, coarse grain values that you might have. Uh, okay, so for Shannon had to be continuous, then you can relax this, you can go to uh, measurable, okay, whatever, but there has to be some uh, regularity, okay? And in fact, those are the only ingredients necessary. This is not quite the Shannon theorem, but like it's the result of subsequent work, but indeed the only thing you need is some regularity in the chain, essentially. And another way of stating that will be this information cohomology thing. 
In fact, yeah, what I say is maybe not quite true because even with all these algebraic characterizations, you also need to impose some kind of symmetry or something equivalent to it. Like, like somehow the function does not care about permutations of the arg arguments. Whereas in this information cohomology approach, you don't really need that. So in fact, yeah, what, what you need to see is, is, is in certain sense is slightly more powerful than like, what was it. And, uh, and then there is like a probabilistic approach the channel says, okay, I don't know what the relation between the two. And he says, the algebraic thing is nice, but this probabilistic thing is what actually matters. What actually matters, and this is the simplest phenomenon that you, you can see, okay? Like, uh, it's, it's not the most realistic, but it's the simplest. If you generate words of length n by, by, by making a lot of independent and identically distributed choices, uh, you will you will get well all sorts of possible words, but like not all of them are equally probable. So you can distinguish a subset of words which are called typical words. These typical words concentrate most of the probability, uh, arbitrarily close to one, if you want, when n goes to infinity, and there are not too many of these words, or they are considerably less than the total number of possible words. So the total number of possible words is the cardinality of the alphabet power n, and these typical words are just exponential of n times the entropy. Like the entropy is upper bounded by log of the cardinality of the alphabet, but it could be much lower. So, so yeah, and, and this is really the actual reason why uh, um, entropy is important, because when you code, you are only going to code for these uh, typical words. And the other ones is like, you're not going to code as well, or maybe you're just going to neglect and complete. Uh, now, the, the, ultimately, and I really want to move forward, but like this has to do with the concentration of the, if you want the simplest case is when you just have a binary choice for, for each symbol, this has to do with the concentration of the binomial distribution around the mean. Uh, uh, and and ultimately has to do with the asymptotics of the multinomial coefficients too. So, so the, the binomial distribution concentrates around its mean and the number of uh, words that correspond to the mean of the binomial distribution is something of the order of the multinomial coefficients or like the binomial coefficients. And, and that grows as exponential of n times the entropy. Okay, so maybe I can also say a bit more. I mean, this will be clearer in, in a second, okay? But just wanted to mention this. Okay, so this has to do with the motivation. Now, what is new in this algebraic perspective that we call information cohomology? So somehow it's like a variation on this first thing, but we'll try to incorporate elements of this second approach. Okay, so uh, now, so according to this information cohomology, which, which was first introduced by, by Pierre Baudot and Daniel Benekan in, in 2015, the Shannon entropy can be seen as a cohomology class. Okay, so it defines an untrivial cohomology class. This is an invariant that is going to be associated with a category of discrete observables. Okay, so in, in their article, uh, you introduce first a category of like finite partitions of a uh, set omega. You see these finite partitions as like the generated sigma algebra of certain like observables or like the, the, the atoms of the corresponding signal algebras. And um, yeah, so there is something like a category of observables. You, you then consider sheaves defined on this category, and you go to a kind of homological theory of these uh, sheaves. And, and the entropy is going to define like uh, a cohomology class there. So this, I'm going to explain in detail in the next uh, the slide, but somehow it's like a topos theoretic kind of invariant. So, so because you're working in these categories of pre sheets over a certain uh, base category, uh, yeah, the, the the relevant tools is like homological algebras developed in uh, the SGA four, like for 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 topos. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so as I said in 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 Daniel's and Pierre's uh, work, uh, the, the 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 approach is very concrete. It's like a category of partitions or a category of orthogonal decompositions of a Hilbert space for the quantum case, we try to find later a more general framework that could accom accommodate everything, like discrete uh, variables, continuous variables, quantum variables. And the, 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 the definition that then I introduce is the definition of information structures 
which somehow is like a, a, an abstraction of this of, of, of the essential features of this of this construction uh, that then applies in this very, very wide range of situations. So, so I mean, information structure is a pair of a, a, a base category and a covariant factor on the category. So the, the, this uh, category S uh, is something that I call a conditional mid similaris. So essentially it's a posit. It's a similaris because you want the product to exist, but indeed you don't want the product to exist always is enough for it to exist every time the two objects are lower bounded by a common one. Okay, so that's the conditional part of the thing. So, and, and the motivation for this condition is from quantum mechanics. Like in quantum mechanics, you cannot make the joint of any two random variables. You can only jointly measure them if they commute. So there is a, there is a condition for them to be jointly measured. So, so yeah, so the, this category, the, the, the objects of the category represent observables. The arrows of the category represents the notion of refinement. So X uh, has an arrow to Y if X is a finer observable than Y. So everything that Y tells you, you can recover it from X. And yeah, and this conditional product has to do with, with this fact that you cannot always jointly observe uh, any two observables. And, and then uh, there is a functor E of uh, possible outcomes, okay? So to each variable, you are going to associate a set of its possible outcomes. In fact, this doesn't have to be a set towards the very, very end. I'll try to suggest a situation where this could be a category too. But let's say it's a set, in all the classical applications. Uh, the important thing is like, because because these arrows represent refinement, these uh, the, the induced arrows by the factor represent surjections or essential surjections or the fact that yeah, whatever, again, whatever you can measure in terms of y, you can express in terms of x. And and to, to in fact, so be compatible with probabilistic intuition, you need that the space of outcomes of the joint variable is included in the, or somehow can be embedded in the product of the space of outcomes of x and y. So so somehow giving a meaning to the, to the notation x, y uh, equals uh, little x, little y, you see? so. So I'm not asking that the joint exactly is uh, takes values in the product, but has to be take values in a subset. Uh, and then uh, you have a factor of probabilities that like somehow you can define in terms of this one. So you're going to introduce all the probabilities. Um, so yeah, for every EX, you're going to introduce all the probabilities that can be defined on that set EX. Okay, I'm oversimplifying because in the continuous case, it's more complicated, but essentially that's the idea. And then to every arrow, you're, there will be a corresponding marginalization because, because this surjection induces a, a, a map at the level of the probabilities. So this is covariant too, but you can then also dualize. So you can see measurable functions defined on these spaces of probabilities, and this uh, makes the functor contravariant. Then you have a factor of functions of probabilities that is contravariant. So co both covariant and contravariant are relevant, but for the entropy, the contravariant ones are more relevant because the entropy is a function defined on probabilities. So, so there, there is where you're going to find the entropy. So, so for this theory of information functions, we take this contravariant approach. Now, What is information cohomology? Well, this is the, 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 the construction. So you observe that for every variable, when you look at the variables that are coarser than it, because we have supposed that there is a product in the category, we have an induced monoid. So we have this monoid of the variables that are coarser than X. Now, of course we can take like the, the induced uh, algebra the, like the, uh, the, of the monoid and now we can see this pair uh, as a, a uh, as a ring site. So again, like we apply this kind of general construction. In particular, uh, we can consider the, the category of A modules. So this category of A modules is an Abel in abelian category. And so we can introduce the right factors. Uh, and the derived factors that are going to be relevant are the derived factors of the homomorphisms from the constant pre-shift. So this is just the pre-shift that associates the real 
applying to each variable and the identity maps to the arrows. Uh, yeah, so these are X, R, and then here we can put whatever we want. And yeah, and this whatever we want is going to be like the coefficients of the cohomology. You know? So the, co the, the, the information cohomology with coefficients in M is this X, R, M. Uh, okay, so uh, expressed like this indeed looks very analogous to group cohomology, uh, where you work with the category of the rings, uh, so like of the modules where the ring associated with the group, and then you take X of uh, C uh, as a trivial module, and then like whatever like module you're considering. Uh, and as with the group cohomology, we of course we won't work with this with a very abstract thing. We introduce the bar resolution. So also we mimic that from group cohomology. So we have a bar resolution for the R module, and in fact, yeah, what we're going to actually consider group uh, information cohomology is this sort of concrete uh, incarnation of it with the bar construction, uh, where indeed you get this sort of very explicit. Uh, equations. Uh, so there are these very explicit to cycle equations. Now, the only thing to take into account is like, okay, these are sheets. You know? so, so the bar construction is, 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 um, is, is the sheaf and, and, and then also, then we have natural transformations between sheets. So that uh, all these elements are indeed elements of M. And in our situation, this M will always be a space of functions. So in this, these cycle equations are functional equations, uh, which induces like yeah, a certain level of complication when treating, actually computing this, this um, cohomology. And that's why it's not so easy to do. But it's also, that's why the entropy appears. Okay, so, so yeah, these are like the sort of the fundamental result if, that uh, Goodall and Benicam proved in 2015. This is the fundamental result. And it's basically the fact that, yeah, that, that, that in a certain situation, so, uh, the entropy defines a one co cycle. So, so, what is this situation? So, you take an information structure, but now we, we restrict to the case where, okay, also this is a kind of anachronic uh, description because uh, there are no information structures in Goodall and Benicam, but uh, this is the case of finite partitions. Okay, so you take an information structure, uh, uh, and then um, you assume that every outcome space is finite. Okay, so representing like the possible outcomes of a discrete random variable. And this is just a reminder of what the monoid is. So, so now you have a set, in principle, just a vector space of the measurable functions from the probabilities on X or this probabilities on X is really probabilities on E X, no? Probabilities on E. And this uh, to, with real value. So this forms uh, a vector space. Uh, now, the monoid S X acts on this space. And I mean, this is a, a key construction. So. So if you take one of these functions, phi, you can define this new function y.5 for any y that is coarser than x. And what you're going to do is this sort of average where you're going to evaluate the phi on this conditional loss where you're conditioning on the different values that y can take, seeing that as a law on x, which is the finer variable. And then you take the expected value of all that. Okay, so this, of course, this is like, inspired by this recursive relation that appeared in Shannon's characterization. Uh, and this uh, defines, and uh, is really a monoid action. So, so if you act with a Y and then you act with C is the same thing as acting by the joint variable CY uh, with the batch. Uh, so, and then, of course, it extends linearly. So this is really defines and and everything is functorial. So it defines an A module. So you can take coefficients with this A module. And yeah, the theorem is uh, when this is the module, then every one per cycle is given by uh, Shannon and okay. Now, I'm supposing here that the structure is connected. So <clears throat> there is just Shannon entropy and the cycles are multiples of it. 
if there are several connected components, indeed, you can introduce like a different multiple in each connected component. So, so then when there are many connected components, the cohomology uh, is like, yeah, has the same dimension as the number of connected components. What is defined as a connected component? Indeed, you have to, this posit S is supposed to have a terminal object. So indeed, if you see it as a CWU complex, like I don't know, the graph of that, uh, it's always connected because everything is connected to the terminal. But you have to remove the terminal object. And then the, those are the, how you define the, the connected components. Now, what does it mean? And this is maybe like a side point like, that follows from the definitions, but I'm not going to explain the details, but there is a notion of locality that is very important here. Because indeed, when I say this one cycle is given by this, what do I mean? In fact, a one could chain, as I, as I tried to say above, Somehow there is one of these equations because, be, 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 because a co chain is an element. We're talking about one co cycles, no? So a one co cycle is an element of the natural transformations of B1 uh, M. Okay. Now, this B1 is generated by, by, this, by these funny symbols where the arguments of the symbols are taken from SC for every C. Okay, so, so for every for every C, uh, you're going to have these symbols X, uh, Y, et cetera, where the X, Y are taken from uh, SC, okay, from the monoid that corresponds to C. So indeed there is a lot of information to, to, that is required to specify a cycle a priori, because you, you have these functions. I mean, I'm saying, I'm, I'm in the case where M is a, is a, is a space of functions. So you have, all these functions that are indexed by every object of the category C, and then by all these funny symbols in brackets that uh, are taken from the monoid of variables coarser than C. So it's a lot of information a priori, but there is this notion of locality where indeed over, over an object C, this, fu this function phi Cx indeed is already determined by phi Xx. And yeah, I mean, maybe here I, I was not very clear with this notation because this is a, it's a law on C, it's a, it's a probability on the space EC, so on, on EZ, but this in, is a probability on EX. So indeed what is implicit here is like you're marginalizing. So, so yeah, I mean, again, I no hope of explaining this in, in completely explicitly, but the naturality of the natural uh, of the of these natural transformations like 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 that i'm referring here implies this notion of locality and the locality in this functional case corresponds to the fact that yeah like everything is determined by by this sort of coarser element which is x um, so yeah so, so the, that's the sense in which this completely defines uh, the cycle indeed this this is the value of the cycle on the object x itself but then by marginalization it's obtained for all the others you have the impression that maybe that was very obscure except for people that are already a bit familiar with this but okay just ignore it uh, okay then there is the issue of uh, probabilistic functionals the two i said like well, it's a generalization so so this is the first probabilistic functional that appears as a co-cycle. Indeed, then we show that there are more. So I showed this in 2017. It was only published in, the, in 2020, I think, but uh, you can deform the action, okay? So now it's like an expected value, but you add a little alpha up here. So this alpha is a number, uh, yeah, I didn't write this down, but I have to write it down. It's a number uh, be, uh, in zero infinity, yeah, any number between zero and infinity. Of course, when it's one, we are just in the case of O. So here we are going to suppose that it's not one, okay? So this is theorem is for zero infinity uh, uh, minus one. So if S is connected and non-degenerate as above, like this non-degenerate is very technical anyway, but it's nothing very, like it's very, it's a very generic condition. Then a one cycle is given by a multiple of this functional, sorry, there should be an alpha here. And this is called the Salis alpha entropy, okay? So the Salis alpha entropies appear also as one cycle. 
And again, the number of constants depend on the on the number of connected components. Yeah, because in general, you can recover this as a co-boundary, but uh, yeah, somehow there is like a global determination when you recover it as a co-boundary. So if you have more than one connected component, still you could play with the other connected components that are not yet determined. So there's still some free things. To, yeah, anyway, and in both cases, in, indeed, uh, the key ingredient for the proofs is that there is some kind of locality. The non-degeneracy means that you can indeed look at certain like a small subjections that do not collapse many things. And, and for those subjections, you can recover uh, the, the, the thing that is called the fundamental equation of information theory. So, so the fundamental equation of information theory is a functional equation whose solutions are these like entropies uh, is sort of concealed in this co-cycle condition. Now, okay, I realized that I'm going way slower than what I wanted, but this always happens with every possible talk, so it's fine. I guess like, we're going to survive, but okay, so maybe I would be more vague with certain things, but it's like a combinatorial version of the theory. In the combinatorial version of the theory, and maybe this is to establish a bridge with the probabilistic aspect that I mentioned at the beginning, you, the, the fundamental objects are not probabilities, but histograms, if you want. So instead of assigning to each possible output a probability, you are going to assign it a natural number. The natural number is the number of times that you saw that outcome. Okay. And then uh, the condition is like, like, at least you made one observation. Okay. So this is not like completely degenerate. Uh, and then there is also a notion of marginalization. Basically, like if you, any subjection, uh, allows you to transform a, a more refined instagram into a coarse grain instagram uh, and you can introduce again like functions on this so uh, measurable functions of uh, these histograms instead of probabilities uh, for like notational reasons it's convenient to pass to a multiplicative notation rather than an additive notation you're going to see immediately why uh, and there is also an action the action is defined by by this. Uh, so it's, it's similar to the other one. Of course, you can also condition these histograms in the sense that you, do res you just restrict the counting to a certain subset. You, you forget whatever happened outside that sub subset. Um, so yeah, it's very similar to the Shannon thing, but there is no prefactor. Uh, so it's just a product of this phi of the restricted thing. Now, this defines some uh, a module that uh, of like this turns G into uh, uh, a set of which like SX uh, acts as a monoid, you can extend it to the whole uh, uh, algebra generated by SX. So you get a good module on which you can compute the, the cohomology, okay? So the cohomology in dimension series is, is, is generated by the exponential function, it's one dimensional. Uh, in which sense? In the sense that the cycle equation is really something that turns sums into, into products. So it's the, the phi of a sum becomes the product of the phi of, of, the, of, of the different uh, summons. So it's really the, the functional equation that characterizes the exponential function. And the one cycles are generalized multinomial coefficients. So this were introduced over like a century ago by Fontenay and Ward. Uh, they look like multinomial coefficients. The only difference is that you uh, uh, allow uh, factorials that instead of being defined by the decreasing sequence of integers are defined by a decrease, uh, any, any sequence. Uh, so th then this dn, dn minus one, d1, it's just uh, any sequence of numbers. Okay, we do ask d1 to d1 though. And the cycle equation, because it's multiplicative, that's why we move to multiplicative notation. Indeed, for example, for, for the usual multinomials, it looks like this uh, multiplicative relation satisfied by the multinomials. It's like, if you wanna count words in three symbols, you can first count words in two symbols, and then you can count uh, subwords, uh, different ways of uh, replacing one of these fake symbols by the actual other two symbols that you cared about. So it's like an iterative counting. And this indeed, like this, all these counting things, yeah, that's really close to the spirit of what you do in information theory. And then of course you can recover here that the usual multinomials by taking the usual factorial. 
and also what are called the Q multinomial coefficients by taking like this this final choice for the end. Okay, so these Q multinomial uh, are very relevant that I, they they appear a bit later. Okay, now now I will remark as C suppose coincidence is like if you look at a zero cycle is 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 a multiple. Well, multiple means here taking powers. It's a multiple of the exponential uh, function. And this k uh, is a constant. A constant is a zero cycle in the probabilistic theory. So somehow there is a, the, the, the probabilistic cycle appears in the combinatorial cycle. And similarly here, like a one cycle uh, in, the, in the combinatorial theory is a multinomial coefficient. So here I'm just writing two examples. But at least in some cases, for example, for the usual multinomials, this is really classical, the multinomial grows x exponential of n times the entropy of the corresponding proportions of the symbols, okay? Now I proved in 2019 that it's also true for the Q multinomial. So uh, it, this grows as exponential of n squared, some constant, and then the Salis to entropy of the corresponding proportion of the symbols. So this is a coincidence, like that every time like that you have sort of a combinatorial cycle, here you have a probabilistic cycle. Also, when this grows like n, and here you have this one, and this grows like n squared, and here you have this two. And that nothing of that is a coincidence. And why? It's because okay, the combinatorial identity, the one cycle condition for the multinomial coefficients, this is what I saw before. Now you you count. You can words in three symbols. You put two of the symbols together. You count these more simple words, and then you you count subwords of way of substituting the, the, the fake symbol with the real symbols. If you think about the exponential ex uh, growth of these multinomials and you replace that in this identity, you are going to see that here you have the entropy uh, p1, p2, p3. Here you have the entropy of the coarse grain. Uh, system, and here you have the conditional entropy. So indeed, yeah, the, this implies the multiplicative relation here implies the additive relation for the entropy. And so this holds in general indeed. So, so if you have a combinatorial one cycle, and you suppose that this combinatorial one cycle grows as exponential of n alpha and some measurable function of uh, the relative frequencies of each symbol, then indeed this function has to be the corresponding alpha cycle. So it has to be the Salis alpha entropy or the Shannon entropy in the case alpha equals one. And it's just like a consequence of what we saw before because the multiplicative relations of phi are going to imply additive relations for psi and the additive relations are precisely the cycle condition. And there's just one solution for every alpha up to a multiplicative constant. So yeah, that's why you cannot, that, that does not fully determine the value of this constant though. I mean, you still have to do some more synthetic analysis, but but you know, it has to be the, the, the corresponding entry. I'm, I'm not doing that bad with the time, but like, I'm also not doing that good. Like, so uh, let's see. So now I want to mention the vector value case. Okay, and maybe this is to finish like the foundational or like the, the, the part that is already my thesis, I don't know. Uh, so you take a uh, finite dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, so the, the Euclidean metric here uh, will be important because uh, the differential entropy is a relative, I mean, in fact, all entropy is a relative concept. It's just that uh, in the usual entropy that's not, cannot be seen because we are so used to taking the counting measure as something more natural than any other measure that you could put on a finite set, but indeed that's not true. So uh, the, 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 the discrete entropy also depends on a reference measure. The reference measure is the counting measure. Here, things are a bit more delicate. So if you, if you, if you take the differential entropy, it's going to depend on the reference measure. Of course, you can take the reference measure, the standard Lebesgue measure, but the problem is that to, to have a standard Lebesgue measure, you have to pick a basis. And if you have a fixed basis, and this is something that we sort of realized with Daniel, it was very delicate, you can't 
characterize the entropy by a cycle thing. Because you're going to see a lot of spurious cycles that are kind of moments that depend on the basis that you chose. So indeed, to recover the entropy uh, cohomologically, you need to work with a vector space without fixing a basis. But if you don't fix a basis, then how do you define uh, uniquely what you're going to call the, Le the Lebesgue measure? So one way of doing that is by defining an uh, Euclidean metric. So if you have an Euclidean metric, then you will have a, a, a corresponding Lebesgue measure, basically because you can define what's the unit group Q. The problem is like, of course, you could change the Euclidean metric. So, so, so basically, yeah, like the entropy is not invariant under changes of the ambient Euclidean metric. And this is like a little like technical complication to take into account. But yeah, basically, if you want to read this part, it's like the important thing to have in mind is like, yeah, one needs to work in a basis independent way, uh, which means also, and maybe this is a remark that's going to appear, that like, yeah, some things are not that obvious. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. Maybe next slide, I, I can say something else. So you pick a clean space. Now, the, the posit S is now a posit of subspaces of E, okay? The, the conditional product uh, thing becomes existence of intersections. Uh, the intersections of spaces exist every time they uh, uh, contain a common space. Now, you can introduce a factor of a possible values in a sort of very canonical way. Once you have this category of all the spaces, you define the possible values to be this quotient of spaces. So the, the, the quotient of E by the corresponding subspace. That immediately gives you something that is very functorial because every time that you have an inclusion, then that induces a surjection at the level of the quotient. The problem is like, okay, it's very difficult to work that way. So indeed, we, we, we also use the Euclidean space to explicitly identify the quotient with the orthogonal space of P, okay? And again, this has some technical role in the thing. Now, I, I mean, ideally you don't want to do this, but it's an open problem how to do, how to do it without, without this. Now, if you take Gaussian probability loss on the set, uh, that's not enough because uh, every time that you condition, uh, you are you are going to find a law that now is not supported on the full space; it's supported on some affine subspace. So indeed, you have to enrich the number of laws that you're considering. You have to consider laws on the whole space E x. Sorry, this yeah, or on some affine subspaces of it. Those arise for, by condition. And now you consider a pre sheaf of functionals on this loss, okay? I'm only considering Gaussian loss for the moment. The more general loss appear a bit later. Of course, what, what is the thing and why Gaussian? It's because you have to control now convergence of integrals. And this is part of all the like headaches that appear when you try to treat the general case. And for example, because Gaussian loss decrease uh, exponentially in the mean, uh, the functions that we are going to consider are functions that grow at most polynomially in the mean. So the, the integrals will always be well-defined. And once you have this, this thing, you can define a conditional action pretty much as, as we did before. So, so B represents a certain observable. It's an element of S, and this is an arrow in S. So this is a coarser element. And now we can define conditioning by that thing uh, as, as we did before. It's like an expected value of phi evaluated in this conditional loss, uh, an expected value with respect to the marginalization of rho. Okay, with to double, you, marginalize, you marginalize rho to double u. Uh, this is the picture, okay? So maybe this is like here. So you have a space EV, it's a big space. Here you have a certain law, okay? So maybe it's not supported in the whole space, it's supported in a certain subspace. You're going to project. So it will define uh, another law, which has its own support in the image. Uh, yeah, and everything has to be nicely compatible like this. These are the conditional laws. The conditional laws are, are supported on the fibers of this projection map, okay? So the picture should make clear that indeed, 
the dimension is already at the cycle. Because if you consider the dimension of the support of the law, this is like the dimension of the image, okay, uh, law, plus an expected value of the dimension of this conditional loss, which are all of the same dimension. It's all the dimension of the kernel. So the dimension of the support is the dimension of the image of the support plus an expected value of the is just the dimension of the kernel. So the nullity rank theorem is like the cycle condition. This was extremely nice to, 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 to recognize back then. Uh, and indeed, this is the only like probabilistic one cycle just without any qualification because of this issue that like the differential entropy uh, depends also on the reference measure. So, so to recover the referential, the differential entropy, you have to introduce something a bit more general than F. Okay, so these are functions that depend on the raw and on the reference measure, and that uh, have uh, a kind of variation with respect to choice of the reference measure that you can uh, understand. Okay, so again, technical thing that I'm putting under the rug, but you can define this. And now when uh, F is included in this X, okay, this is a more general thing that of course, I mean, uh, contains the things that do not change at, at all when you change the reference measure, but also things that, that have this sort of nice variation. And when you work with this module, then the one cycles cycles are convex combinations of this thing, which is the determinant of the covariance matrix of Ross. So this, remember, we are working with Gaussian laws. So, so this is the, the entropy of the law and the dimension of the support. Okay, so th these are the one cycles. cycle. Now, in fact, the determinant depends on uh, the choice of the Lebesgue measure. And this is not that obvious to see, but like, again, we could talk about this in, in the in the question part if you want. But but uh, the determinant, I mean, requires some choice. Okay, you, you can be, essentially you have to identify, you have you have to find a way of like relating the dual space with, with a vector space with its dual. And the, the, the Lebesgue measure is one way of doing it. And the one cycle condition for this thing is uh, is sure's determinant of formula. And you can do you can generalize this to more general laws under some hypothesis. Now here the analysis become very complicated, and in fact this is not fully solved. But uh, what I think is algebraic, the answer is is in this algebraically the answer is here. It's just there are some analytical problems to address still. So basically, if you allow yourself to mix discrete and continuous measures, then you, you can use something like a key fact from probability. And it's like any density can be approximated in L1 by a convex combination of Gaussian densities. So this, this, these are no uh, kernel estimates. In fact, this, this is used in the statistics to, to estimate the density from samples, okay? Uh, so this is convergence in L1 of the densities. Uh, by Sheffield's lemma, this is convergence of the corresponding measures in total variation norm. So if you suppose now that these functionals that you are considering are continuous in the total variation norm, provided you can identify what's the entropy of a convex combination of Gaussian densities, then you can use continuity to approximate what should be the entropy of, 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 of the law. And this, this is exactly what I, what I do in this article. So, so somehow from knowing what is the entropy of a discrete variable, which we know is Shannon entropy, and from this determination of the Gaussians that we just discussed, now by this limiting procedure, in, in, in fact, you can go to the general case. So this is closer to Shannon's uh, result because we're supposing continuity of, of the entropy. But now you can you can go and say that every cycle is at a complex combination of, of the differential entropy and the dimension of the support of rock. Okay, so I have maybe six or seven minutes, uh, according to my clock at least, I don't know. And I just wanted to mention some more open problems. Uh, and again, I think we can discuss more in the questions if, if you have questions, but one thing is like, what is the relation between symmetry and entropy? And this is not naively, you, you can't do it. Okay, so for example, if you have a set E, the uniform distribution has maximum symmetry in the sense that, yeah, you can permute like all the elements of E and 
So yeah, it's maximum symmetric and also maximum entropy. So you would say, okay, well, maybe there is like a one-to-one -one correspondence, you know, but not really, because if you take the uniform distribution and you perturb it even slightly, then you break all the symmetry. Uh, in, in, in uh, permutational symmetry. So you, 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 you can find a relationship that way, but you can change a bit your perspective. So in, instead of thinking about symmetries of E, now you think about long words with certain empirical law rule. So the empirical law refers to the relative frequency of every possible symbol in that word. The group, the symmetric group on N letters acts on uh, words of length N by permuting the order of the symbols. And now it is true that if you have two words whose empirical laws are close to each other, then the corresponding stabilizers of those words are close to each other. Now we're talking about very big groups and they are indeed close to each other. And the multinomial coefficient indeed corresponds to a quotient now of the, the full symmetric group by the stabilizer of any word whose relative law is given by that. Uh, and then you recover the entropy. Okay, so if I come back to what I mentioned before, you have the Q multinomial coefficient, okay? I said before this Q multinomial coefficient that uh, in principle, uh, they, this were, yeah, okay, whatever. I mean, they, they, they are given by these funny factorials uh, that I defined uh, before. So this is the N, uh, v1, and then you, you take the other factorials, the corresponding factorials down here, where the n is qn minus 1, q minus 1. Okay, So this is the definition I introduced before. But indeed, these q multinomials, which grow like n, n squared s2, this is the result that I cited before, correspond to a quotient 2. It's the quotient of the general linear group of an fq. Okay, now q, I'm assuming q is a, is a prime power. Divided by a, as a quotient by a parabolic subgroup, which is an stabilizer of a, of a certain flag. Okay, so so th this group was the stabilizer of a certain word, which which certain statistics. Now this parabolic subgroup is the stabilizer of a certain flag with certain statistics too. Okay. So uh, work that is ongoing and about to be put in archive. I I, I hope in the next two weeks is that indeed you can do something similar for more general finite groups. So for example, here, the symmetric group is a reflection group. And you could ask, well, what happens with the other reflection groups? Uh, and indeed, uh, when you consider the quotients of other reflection groups by parabolic subgroups, they also grow that exponential of n times something but that something is not quite the entropy. There is like an additional term that you have to take into account. It's like a bit of a deformation of the entropy. And basically it has to do with the corresponding Dinkin diagram. It has, it's like very uniform, but there is something different that happens at the very end. And that, that something different that happens at the very end contributes with this additional term. And similarly, this GLM FQ is a finite group of Lee type. It's a Chevalier group. So you could say, okay, what happens when you consider other finite groups of Lita? So indeed, uh, Ryan uh, made the computations for SP2N and similarly for ON, they are, they are very similar. And he saw that when you take, let's say SP2N and, 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 and you quotient by a parabolic subgroup, this grows as Q to the power N squared something. And that something is uh, the Salis 2 entropy, but again, there is like an additional term that has to be taken into account. And, and this is again related with the corresponding like thinking diagrams. So we have this asymptotic formulas, but now question, uh, are these co-cycles in some sense? Like what should be the module that makes this cycle cycle? Well, there's even a more fundamental question. It's like, what is the corresponding category to it? So I think like the corresponding category of uh, S should have something to do with thinking diagrams. The, the arrows being like kind of uh, surjections of some thinking diagrams and other thinking diagrams. And, and then, yeah, and then there is a question of what is the module? Like, how can you see this as a cycle cycle? So that's maybe a first thing. There is like another issue of dimension, okay? So indeed, we saw that this vector space dimension is an invariant of vector value of zero. In, 
there is a more general notion of dimension. It's called Rainy dimension. It's defined in terms of the asymptotic divergence of discretizations of certain laws. So you take a law on RD, you discretize it by dividing RD into little cubes. And then as you make the cubes smaller and smaller, the Shannon entropy of the discretized measure is going to explode to infinity. But the rate of divergence indeed is meaningful. And the rate of divergence is what is called information dimension. So question. Is this information dimension a one cycle? In fact, you can see that it's a one cycle on certain projections that respect this division of RD into cubes. But I think that probably that's not the best definition to treat the one cycle condition in its whole generality. So, so there, you can also do it with arbitrary coverings, like the sort of Kolmogorov epsilon entropy. I mean, there is a better way of seeing that this is a one cycle in general. Uh, yeah, and I, well, whatever, I won't even mention this, but there is also some kind of probabilistic interpretation for what this D is. And I think I'm already uh, past 15 minutes, but I only have like two more slides. So that, that's okay, uh, one yeah. problem, just continue, thanks. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, so this is a one good cycle that you can attach to variables that are like more general than vector value. In fact, this, there is no geometric condition at all, okay? But, but of course, when Rho has some geometric quality to it, for example, if Rho is supported on a, a compact manifold of dimension S, this D is going to be S. So this, this D knows about some intrinsic geometry. So now you could say, okay, maybe it does not work in full generality. Let's work in, in some category of observables that are not vector valued, but whose geometry we can still sort of parameterize in some reasonable way. So, for example, I think a very tractable case is homogeneous space. Because, indeed, you can define this in a very similar way to what I did before. So, in the continuous case, you take a vector space, and you take this category of subspaces of uh, the vector space. For a group, you take, uh, let's say, like a locally compact topological group. I could say a Lie group, okay, whatever. And then you take a subgroups, okay? Maybe you want to take the normal close, I don't know. You take subgroups. And there is an intersection condition that should be similar to what we introduced for the Euclidean case. Now you can do similar constructions that we did before. So to every subgroup, we associate an outcome space, which is the quotient of the total group by that subgroup. Now, every time that you have an inclusion of subgroups, that is going to induce a surjection at the level of the outcome spaces. So you can play all the same game. Indeed, the game goes very well because you can also prove that it, the, when you introduce probabilistic functionals, you're going to have an A model. Because the proof that we have in the Euclidean case indeed works for any topo locally complex topological group. It only depends on this disintegration formula. So the part of the work is already done. But the question is, what are the cycles? Uh, and then I have no idea. But the, of course, the dimension will be a cycle. Uh, I think that should be pretty clear from, from from the more general developments, in fact, I mean, from, from the question that I introduced in the, in the previous slide. But other cycles should appear. So, for example, uh, for example, we have an oriental book vibration, you have this multiplicative property of, of the uh, early characteristics that would translate into this additive property. This additive property should be a cycle too. Of course, the problem here is that you might have divergences. Because, well, the early characteristic might be zero. So I don't know. Again, you have to treat all these cases of divergences or how to get rid of that. I don't know. Like, it's a bit tricky. But the, the conjecture essentially is like there are more co cycles, and these new co cycles know something or more things about the geometry or the topology of the problem. But should, there should be more than that. Maybe there should be things that mix probability and topology. Uh, that would be the most satisfactory thing that you don't see when you work with vector spaces because the topology is trivial. So, anyway, and the last thing, and maybe related with this, uh, is like how to characterize in similar ways the entropy of categories. So, so I, I think like Tom already talked, and Tom uh, Lenster already talked at this seminar now and, uh, about magnitude and magnitude is a categorical generalization of cardinality. 
you can see entropy as an, a, a probabilistic extension of cardinality because somehow you recovered log of the cardinality for the uniform law, but then for all the others, you have something that is smaller. So is there a categorical entropy, some common generalization of magnitude and entropy of sets? And the proposal that I made with a student like uh, last year is that, yeah, there should be something which is like essentially the log diversity of metric spaces, but just apply to arbitrary categories. So, so the entropy should be something like this, where like PA is a probability on the objects of A, and this uh, theta is a function of pairs that vanishes whenever there are no morphisms between the objects. So now this, this, this function knows about the category, but in a very coarse grain way. Okay, so we, it's already the case with magnitude anyway. I mean, magnitude, yeah, it's defined in terms of what's called the coarse uh, incidence algebra. And it satisfies many good properties. For example, when you work with discrete categories, uh, you recover a Shannon entropy. When you have products of these triples, then uh, this is additive over products. You can define like convex combination of these triples where like basically you take like these joint uh, categories and you weight them in certain way. And uh, yeah, you, there is a corresponding chain rule under that operation. So you can recover also the magnitude. So, so in some cases you can take P as some kind of un uniform law that is defined in terms of the magnitude. And then you, this gives you log of the magnitude. So similar to what you do with the entropy. So all that works. But there is no algebraic characterization of this function. I mean, even for metric spaces, there is no, I think there is an algebraic characterization, but yeah, okay, maybe I won't go that far. There is an algebraic characterization, but there is something along the lines of entropy. So maybe what we were playing with is, okay, could you characterize this as information loss in the in the sense of like Pais, Fritz, uh, Leinster? And in fact, no. And the problem is the following is like, in in the in the in their characterization, uh, everything follows from this convexity. But why the convexity helps is because you can express any finite set as a convex combination in the sense of the category they work with of singletons. And on the singletons, you know what is the entropy? You know, it's like like it's, it's nothing. A singleton has no entropy. So so it's essentially, they can recover these functional equations that I was showing before, and, and they, 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 they conclude a characterization. But things are more complicated for categories because it's not true that if you take any category with these probabilities on it, you can express it as a convex combination of the terminal object. Okay, So the terminal object is like one point category with the trivial probability of the trivial transition kernel. It's not, it, it's not true that, that that you can express any categories of complex combination does. So, so the, this the, uh, this continuity complexity is not enough anymore to characterize this thing as as information loss. And and I think indeed this homological characterization can be better suited for it because if you take now you have to think about a different kind of operation. It's not complex combinations. Is you take a category and you project it towards a category. Uh, you project it towards another category. So you take, a, let's say, an essentially subjective functor. And now you have to think, of what is conditioning under that functor? So you will have this certain conditional law, certain conditional kernels, theta. Uh, and then you need to find something that is the co-cycle equation that we've been considering. So, so indeed, there is, there is more hope, I think, that a, a characterization can be found around those lines. But, but these conditioning operations look very complicated. I don't know very well how to operate with them yet. Yeah. Anyway, I gotta finish here. I, I'm well over time. I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you, Juan Pablo. That's a that was a very intriguing talk with all all these connections to to new things and and yeah, there are so many questions as you said. Um, I think you did a good uh good job of of giving us the breadth of that. Uh, so now we're going to go into question time, uh, for the colloquium, and there are two ways to ask questions. One is that you could type your question in the meeting chat uh, because some people, they are not able to unmute themselves. They can type their question in the chat and I'll ask on your behalf. Or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you to unmute yourself to ask the question. So uh, I see that Andrea Blas, you have a question. You uh, yes, um, something something in my intuition doesn't work. I I expect that if you take, let's just take finite discrete probability distribution. Yeah. 
given by a sequence of probabilities. If you continuously vary those probabilities and let one of them approach zero, yeah. then that should be essentially equivalent to having a slightly smaller probability space where that element is just no longer present. Yeah. And that that is, I mean, that process is continuous for Shannon entropy. But in one of your slides, I think maybe four or five slides ago, there was a formula where you you were adding something to an entropy that depends specifically on the last of the probabilities. Yeah. And it seems to me that if you have a continuous variation where that last probability approaches zero and the others adjust so they still add up to one, you'll get a discontinuity in that extra term. And somehow that makes me nervous. Uh, can you make me not nervous about that? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. Anyway, that we have not published that yet. So, I mean, I think that it might be the case that we're making some mistake there. But what I want to say is that in these situations, there is not really quite that much symmetry between everything uh, as, um, it, as in the usual case of words. Because precisely like this, so yeah, okay. So our reflection group is given uh, uh, by like a set of fundamental roots. No? And, and these fundamental roots like have, sometimes they commute. Like, uh, so, so they, they represent certain reflections. These reflections sometimes commute, sometimes they, they don't commute. No? Then you're representing these diagrams, these thinking diagrams, when they commute and when they don't commute. Okay, so you get these possible shapes of the thinking diagram. For example, let's say you take like a group of type B, the thinking diagram looks pretty much like uh, um, yeah. It looks pretty much like the group of type A. It's just at the very end, there is a change. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, uh, so the but, idea is like if you if you if you make PK go to zero, you are going to somehow change type of group. So you're going to go from something that is type B to type A because essentially you are not you're you're kind of killing the part that is indeed different from from uh, that makes a big group a big group. Yeah. So should I should I think of the uh, the subscripts on P, the numbers that go from one to S, as actually not just some number subscript, but as referring to points of the Dinkin diagram. Yeah, yeah. So then the, S is somehow a special one, such that if you were to remove that, it would even change type. So for instance, if you were doing a D, you would have a long chain and then a little branching at the end. S would be one of those two little branches. Is that the idea? Yeah, I mean, maybe it will do it for me because the, I think those are the ones that we understand better. Like, it's like, okay, so you have like your, your I mean, yeah, essentially what, what, what is going to happen is like, okay, you have this group and here, like at the end, you have this like different uh, edge. Huh? So now this, this P1 is like the number of roots, like a first group of, of roots. It's like, P, they're like P1N yeah. roots, okay? Then you skip one and then you have like P2N roots, etc. And then you skip one and then you have P3N groups. So somehow, there is a last group of roots which contains this 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 different edge, which, which, is the, edge. which is PSN. So somehow, if now the probability of this last group goes to zero, it's like okay, you have killed the part that it did corresponds to a B thing, and now mm -hmm. you're going to have this that corresponds to to only to a to an A thing. No? Oh, now, okay, so so it might be that I'm not writing it here correctly, and and I, I but I think this is this is uh, what we have so far. But in any case, that's the idea behind the fact that uh, there is a change anyway. Uh, you, you, and at some point, yeah, you would expect to find uh, when you collapse this sort of a different part, you would expect to have something that depends only on the entropy, so it's of the type a constant plus the entropy, which is what we what we find here. So the constant might correct by the fact that maybe we are not always counting the same kind of thing. Like like the, the, the basis of what you're counting is a bit different. But but it's something that is a function only is only the entropy essentially. So if if you were doing something in type E, then the S would refer to 
sort of the middle of the Dinkin diagram where well, that one short that, thing. Uh, I will say I don't I don't know what to do with the time B. I mean I think we have treated oh, okay. like the time, uh, we have treated the time. I, I think I wrote it here. No B, C, and D. So those okay. I know. The E, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a bit tricky. But uh, we're still writing this well. And maybe when we write it completely well, maybe it will be obvious what to do with the E. I mean, in the sense that pretty much as what happens in this in this GL case. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, we have to characterize what kind of combinatorial objects these things are counting. So when you when you have these reflection groups, sorry, the 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 groups of Lie type, then it's very natural that they count like flags, and mm -hmm. it's just like when you do a SP, the flags are a bit of a different character. There are like some spaces that are symplectic, etc. Uh, now, um, like maybe one can try to do the same with the reflection groups. And I think like, for example, there is this equivalence where you can see the symmetric group acting on a word, but you can also see it acting as on an induced flag of sets. And indeed these sets, I think can be taken to be corresponding sets of uh, elements of a basis of a vector space in which the group is acting. So yeah, so maybe if we, if we try to push everything towards this language of flags, we have this sort of very unified description of what is the good mental image to have in terms of actions of these groups and flags. Uh, but I think also my knowledge of representation theory also put this a limitation for this too. I mean, I, I would love if more people get it, like interested in this because I do have the impression also that everything that we do for the reflection groups, probably we can see it as embedded into these uh, actions of the groups of Lie type. No, I mean, pretty much as you can see uh, the, mm -hmm. I mean, you can see the, per, the the symmetric group as represented by permutation matrices inside GLM. No? So uh, I, I don't know if this works more generally, I have the impression that it does. No? And then uh, maybe there is like a very unified picture where everything is about flags and how these groups of Lie type act. Okay. Okay, that that I'm not worried anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean no, but it's still I mean it's still Thank like you. getting getting well the constants is I'm still doubting about some constants. I mean it's a bit it's a bit messy computations, but like I hope um, but I think the idea stands anyway. I mean even if like a uh, constant might be a bit off, but I think the the general idea is is what I just told you. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas, for your question. Uh, thanks, Juan Pablo. Um, are there other questions uh, from the Zoom chat? Raise, feel free to raise your hand. Um, I have I have a few questions. So, uh, so I want to ask about uh, the differential entropy part, yeah. where you're talking about how it varies with respect to a reference measure. To to me, that's that's that smells a lot like KL divergence. And I know also in your thesis and other work, you've you've talked about KL divergence as appearing in um, this cohomological picture of information. Like, could could you care to say a bit more about KL divergence? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. I don't know. I did try to do that for continue the continuous case, but I'm pretty sure that probably something along those lines can be done. What what I was shown is that indeed. You can also identify the relative entropy as a cycle. And let me go back to where this has to be. Okay, so the entropy, the relative entropy, you can also identify as a cycle. But hmm. it would, as a cycle, it will be a function. And, and, and I'm sorry, because here I don't remember this by heart exactly, but I will tell you what is the idea. A cycle is a function of two probabilities. Right. Okay? Now, to introduce the action, okay, there will be a conditioning to make on both arguments. So here you're also going to make a conditioning, but also this Q should appear here in the expectation. I mean, that's the, the key thing, but it doesn't appear with the same exponent. And that is the exponent that I don't remember exactly, but I think it's something like Q of Y and maybe alpha minus one, I don't remember one. So it's not, it's not the same exponent. And then you can prove, and this is an interesting exercise, in fact, but we need for the discrete, that 
that this is uh, a one two cycle. But now this the, precisely the, the 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 nice thing is like indeed it does not depend on the choice of reference measure anymore, because the the, the your, when you where you see the counting measure is in the fact that what we call like what we call like the PMF. I mean, there is a difference that gets blurred when you work with discrete variables. Okay, so a discrete measure is a function defined in subsets that takes values in the positive real numbers with certain absolutes. And we treat most of the time a discrete measure as if it was its probability mass function. But the probability mass function is a rather unequally derivative with respect to the counting measure. So there is where the counting measure appears. But in the relative entropy, because it's a function of two arguments, you're taking the rather unequally derivative of one of the laws with respect to another. So indeed, there is no choice of counting, me counting measure that you have to make. So indeed, you would expect this one to be like uh, just a function of p and q, and you don't have to talk about it. And that's what happens in the discrete cases. So I don't know, because I did try, how this looks in the continuous case. And indeed, I think it's a very interesting question, because it would remove part of the technical difficulties that were linked with uh, treating. Um... Yeah, I think maybe it's a good approach for example, to treat that group theoretic case. Because, for example, in, in what happened in the Euclidean case is that, okay, we have to take care of all these uh, reference measures, okay? Every time that you have an arrow in S, so that you have like a refinement, you can, in fact, choose compatibly uh, reference measures on the outcome space of uh, the target variable, the, the, the initial variable, and the, and the conditional loss. Okay, this is how we use this veil formula. is um, the possibility of choosing uh, disintegrations that are in something that's called canonical relation. But you can do this over every single arrow of S, but the problem is to do it over all the arrow of, arrows of S at the same time in a compatible way. I don't know how to do this. Yeah. I don't know how to express uh, a compatible choice of reference measures over the whole S. I don't know how to write this as a section of a functor. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very tricky problem. If someone knows, great. Uh, so this is a problem, for example, that appears in, in the group case. But maybe, for example, if, if you think about these functions of pairs, where the role of the reference measure is not important anymore, maybe mm -hmm. indeed it's easier to treat that. Mm -hmm. I mean, every time you have an arrow, you will just marginalize these two laws. And then every time that you have to take a derivative, you're just going to take a rather nickel in derivative. You're just going to take a derivative of one with respect to the other. And it's like, okay, you don't have to care about the reference measures. Maybe everything is simpler. I don't know. Yeah. I see. I see. That was very helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Um, since uh, the, I have another question. Um, just waiting to see if uh, there are more coming from the audience. Uh, so in yeah, uh, you mentioned about you mentioned the probability of words, right? And and uh, how how that's uh, related to the distribution of of the words being generated are is related to entropy, and that kind of kind of brings to mind like these large language models that everyone's talking about these days, and and when we talk about cohomology of information, it seems like like your the the theory you described here should be able to say something about what's going on. You know, in 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 large language models over time, like uh, we maybe describing topologically what's going on during training or things like that. Do you do you have any sense, like like you know how we can use entropy? Sorry, um, think about these uh cohomological uh, uh co how we can use cohomology to think about what's going on in language models. I mean, I, I know in your thesis you talk about these uh, higher order mutual information, and and that seems like a very intriguing thing to think about. From the language point of view, ah, yeah, well, I don't know. I think there are many things contained in that question, so I will try to answer separately. Like we do talk in the thesis about what would be like higher order information, in the sense that we have not computed these higher homology groups, so we don't know what's there. Okay, like what, what's what's in those groups? So it might be that like those functions are interesting and also tell us things about the statistics that and i thought a lot about that during my thesis 
not not since then though like because mm. got the problems i don't know i don't know i mean it's, it's a tricky thing and I, mm. I don't have an answer and i think nobody has computed yet a non-trivial uh, higher cost cycle i mean we know some uh, trivial ones that can be obtained as the boundary of something but we don't know no, non-trivial so like yeah i don't know that's the first thing what are these tiger information functions and do they capture different kinds of uh, relations between collections of variables that what we can measure today. Yeah, I don't. The second thing is like, okay, what can information theory to begin with say about deep neural networks? I think this is a very open question too. And uh, these probabilistic tools, of course, I mean, yeah, you could, you could, uh, I, and I spent time thinking about that until today. I don't, no, not yet on this cohomological framework, just like from a very basic uh, perspective is like, okay, how information enters the picture uh, of uh, learning. And there are some ideas. There is something called like uh, information bottleneck. I don't know, some years ago, people were talking a lot about that. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, maybe you can understand some aspects of it, like uh, this idea of information bottleneck, or th there might be some other things too. And, and I think like maybe information theory won't provide like a full answer to why deep learning works, but it might provide some uh, inequalities or things that tell you like uh, impose some limits on performance and in certain regimes like uh, like how how much you can do for example I was studying for a while uh, a problem people call like disentangling of factors in in, in learning disentangled factors in, in neural networks so, I don't know you would like for example from images extract a uh, color and position and whatever as like disentangled factors that describe right. the image. But indeed, like the, the, and we did some work on that, like the possibility of disentangling depends on the, the correlations that are present in the data. And so how there are some limits of how successful you are going to be with that, that you can maybe express in information theoretic terms. But I've not published that yet anyway. But, but then, yeah, there could be the question of how do you, how would you combine everything? And, and that's a very tricky question. I think like, well, if you want to know about that, I think you have to talk with Daniel uh, Daniel Brinkham. No, because like, I mean, they are working mainly on that in, 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 at uh, Huawei in Paris. And they're trying to do this uh, approach where to understand neural networks. So indeed, it's also like a, a very natural, I mean, natural thing to do, although I don't know to what extent this will answer practical questions. But, but what they are trying to do is to, to, to look at the neural network as a, uh, uh, as a certain kind of like geometric structure, like a graph or some, some structure of connectivity between different points. And right. then uh, try to associate uh, to this, uh, like, um, again, like you can see to this a category and then a topos of, 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 of sheets and that, like it's not any more per sheets. There is some kind of pasting condition that comes from the, the fact that a single neuron takes many inputs and then gives you like an output. Uh, and then they are studying this 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 topos of, of sheaves and from from a logical perspective too. No, no, it's like and and the hypothesis that they have is that indeed like you can express somehow like what we can decide at every layer of the ne neuron is something that is related uh, or can be expressed in terms of the internal logic of of the of the topos. No, so so mm. they have I guess they have in mind this per sheaf like uh, toposes where indeed you have some kind of evolving, uh, you know, like like the, the truth values are like sections of uh, a, per sheaf, a sheaf, so it's like you have like kind of undeterminations that can become true or false after a while. I don't know, like like there is something that they are doing, they're, they're creating semantic information. Indeed, I wanted to talk about that, but my knowledge is very like superficial of that, but you can define these information structures uh, where <clears throat> instead of observables, you have propositions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the arrows are given by implications. Um, and they have this kind of thing. And then the probabilities, instead of probabilities, they have theories. And you condition theories on, on uh, instead of conditioning probabilities by variables, you condition theories by uh, propositions. And they have, and they can reproduce a lot of this calculus. Indeed, they can use the same homological tool. Uh, now the cycles are not functions anymore. They are not values in real numbers. They are like set valued functions. So they have this sets we call like information spaces, and and they have some cycle relations between them that are like similar 
to the cycle conditions that I show, but the operations are not arithmetic operations. They are like set theoretic operations. But they have not published that yet. So Daniel has a couple of talks that are online on that, but 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 it's not yet on the archive. I see, I see. That's that's exciting. Yeah, that sounds really nice. Thank, thanks a lot, Juan Pablo. Um, okay, so I think uh, we are going to stop the live stream now, and then we'll go to the uh, go back to the Zoom chat where we can ask more questions. So uh, let's thank uh, Pablo uh, Juan Pablo once again um, for the wonderful discussion and talk. Going to end up uh, uh, live streaming on the other side. Uh, oh gosh, uh, sorry. Okay, thank you very much.